Okay, so let me introduce again, just to keep everything in the recording. So this QRST is the second session. We have uh, Arthur Ismailov and Max Henderson. And, and as I said, if you have questions, please raise your hand in the, in the Zoom. And if we are running out of, out of time, you can just wait until the end of, the, of this session to ask more questions to our speakers. Okay, so I think that we can just start with Arthur. I think, you, can you share your screen, Arthur? Uh, no, actually someone, yeah, you it's not sharing to yours. I will, okay, I will stop. Okay. Can you allow now my sharing? Okay, yeah, I can share now. Okay. All right, so let me see. So I will introduce very briefly Arthur. Arthur is, is an uh, associated professor of Department of Chemistry and Physical Environmental uh, Science in University of Toronto. And his work is uh, working in developing simulation techniques for quantum and classical com uh, computers uh, to solve molecular uh, dynamics and electronic structure problems. And he will present this work, this last work on, on the ordinal problem in construction of unitary operation from the variational quantum Megan solver. So go ahead, okay. Artu, welcome. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Just to keep this as uh, close to normal conference as possible, uh, let me start with thanking organizers for inviting me. <laughs> it's my pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah, today I'll tell you how we try to avoid some of the other dependencies in the uh, variational quantum eigensolver uh, solution for the quantum chemistry. And uh, essentially the out outline of my talk is the following. For the physicist in the audience, I will tell a little bit about what quantum chemistry is or how uh, chemists like to use uh, variational quantum eigensolver to solve chemistry problems. Then uh, I'll introduce the problem and I will introduce our view how the Lie algebras and Lie groups can address the problem. Also, I'll illustrate how this Lie algebra Lie group connections can be used in two typical methods, a unitary coupled cluster and qubit coupled cluster for solving quantum chemistry problems on quantum computers. So that's the plan. And uh, what is quantum chemistry? So, it all starts with essentially applying Schrodinger equation for molecules. Molecules are quantum objects, uh, so there's no wonder there that uh, chemistry uh, is described by Schrodinger equation. And uh, we have uh, electrons and nuclei, so the small r's will be electronic coordinates, big r's are nuclear coordinates. And uh, the Hamiltonian of for any molecule can be expressed like this. So essentially it has kinetic energy of all particles and potential energies, which are Coulomb essentially interaction between the charged particles, right? But uh, what is important to kind of emphasize is that electrons are much lighter than nuclei. And therefore uh, what Born and Oppenheimer figured out long ago is that it makes sense to, instead of uh, solving the total Schrodinger equation, uh, first separate the electronic Hamiltonian, where the electronic variables are still uh, treated like variables and the nuclei are treated like parameters. Essentially, you clamp the nuclei in one position and you solve the eigenvalue problem for the electronic Hamiltonian, right? And that is what usually people mean when they say solving electronic structure problem, because the structure appears from clamping nuclei. So nuclei are fixed, and we solve the differential equation for electronic variables. And that's what we're gonna be addressing essentially today uh, with variational quantum eigensolver. Now, why is this useful? Seems like this is just a part of the problem. It is useful because uh, the eigenvalues of this problem, electronic energies, here, they are parametrically dependent on nuclear coordinates. And so if you plot the electronic energies as uh, functions of uh, nuclear coordinates, then you get this potential energy surfaces. And from them, you can get a lot of interesting information like a vibrational spectra, all sorts of spectroscopies. Then if you want to study chemical reactions, you can see what is the potential barrier uh, going from the one molecule information to another, A to B. And so the size of that barrier, the height of that barrier is enough to actually deduce what's the reaction rate at a certain temperature. So that's why solving the electronic structure problem is kind of enough to answer many chemical questions. Uh, that's why it's quite useful. Okay. Now, how do we get to the quantum computing formulation? So in, for that, uh, what we do, we formulate the electronic Hamiltonian in second quantized form. 
So I'm not going to dwell too much into the second quantized form. Hopefully, uh, people are familiar with that in the physics community and chemistry community. And uh, the only difference between, I guess, uh, chemistry and physics here that uh, in chemistry, what we use for our one particle functions, are uh, so-called molecular orbitals. They can be thought as uh, bands, but all like essentially at the gamma point uh, in a condensed matter language. So we have this one particle picture that is obtained using mean field theories like hartree fock and uh, chemists like to call those uh, one particle uh, functions uh, orbitals. Here, the example for the kind of the dearest molecule of all chemists, hydrogen, the simplest one. And uh, it has uh, bonding and antibonding, sigma and sigma star. So just two orbitals. And then you can place electrons on those uh, according to like exclusion principle of Pauli. So you can, you can uh, formulate this uh, essentially configurations. Now, what is important to notice is that uh, in second quantized Hamiltonian, we don't specify the number of electrons a priori. So the Hamiltonian can describe more than two if you are uh, like just working in second quantized form. So it could be one, it can be four, it could be anything in between as long as it's integer, right? Could be a different spin state. So this is something that comes uh, along with the second quantized form. Now, why do we want second quantized form? Because we can map second quantized form to spins or qubits. There's a Jordan Wigner and other uh, ways to do that. They essentially bring us from the second quantized electronic Hamiltonian to a qubit uh, Hamiltonian, which now we can treat using the quantum computer, right? And uh, the, only, the only kind of uh, price we're paying for this mapping, which is nonlinear, Jordan Wigner, say the simplest one, is that for one fermionic operator, we can introduce up to n qubit operators, where n is the number of qubits or the number of uh, essentially spin orbits uh, of the, in our second quantized representation. But in the kind of qubit Hamiltonian, we still have up to well polynomial number of operators, essentially, n to the four, roughly. Okay, so it's, uh, it's still manageable. Now, the most popular method these days is variational quantum eigensolver. And uh, I hope most of you are familiar with that. Uh, it's just uh, essentially hybrid method where we optimize uh, our wave function on a quantum computer, preparing it and measuring the Hamiltonian, right? That's how we got the expectation value. And we minimize the parameters of the unitary transformation uh, using the classical computer, right? So I'm not going to dwell too much into the uh, VQE. There are nice reviews uh, that came out just recently, in chemical review or modern uh, re modern review uh, so physics, right? So yeah, depending on your preferences, you can go with one or another, but they're all good. But the main challenges of uh, variational quantum eigensolver are essentially that the Hamiltonian cannot be measured all the entire Hamiltonian at the same time, right? So we need to chop it to pieces and that makes the process uh, challenging and the computation difficult. And the second problem, which I will uh, focus more about is that the unitary transformation is not so easy to find. Uh, so what do I mean by that? If we dwell more into what, like how do you construct the unitary, general unitary for the qubit space of n qubits, it can be written as a product of these exponents and the exponents of essentially uh, Pauli products, as we call them, the operators P's. So those P operators are products of the sigma uh, matrices of Pauli for each qubit. And maybe some of them will be uh, identities. So essentially trivial action in some of the qubits. But the point here is that if you potentially want to describe any unitary, then you will need for n qubits, you need four to the power of n uh, exponents like this, or minus one, because that's just minus identity, right? But it's an exponential scaling. It's a difficult problem uh, to construct the unitary or represent the unitary. Now, uh, the, the two main aspects of this problem is which piece do you put in this product of the exponents? Because you cannot take all of them. It's just going to be exponentially hard. It defeats the purpose of using quantum computer. Uh, and also, another aspect of this problem is that no matter which ones you put, they usually don't commute 
in general. So then the order matters. And then the second aspect of this, what order do you put them in? Now, the first part, which piece, turns out that there are already good methods to select the pools of the piece that can lower the energy reliably. So they are either based on one particle fermionic picture or just looking at the gradient uh, of energy with respect to uh, the parameter styles that are needed to optimize. So that, that gave rise to other methods, which I will talk more in details later. But essentially there are ways to find the piece which are useful uh, for lowering of energy. And I'm not gonna go too much into that. I'll mostly focus on what order should we put them. And also another disclaimer, I guess, is that I'm not gonna talk about circuits in this talk because I assume, and uh, I think Rigetti at least, uh, they have a compiler that if you provide the piece, that compiler will provide you a circuit essentially. We, we're assuming that uh, this level can be solved uh, at level of the compilers. All right, how do we define what order of piece should we, should we use? For that, Turns out it's useful to consider things uh, under the angle of uh, Lie algebras and Lie groups. And they are named, these this objects, uh, mathematical objects, they are named for the this, uh, name of Norwegian mathematician who came up with these ideas, Sophus Lie. And uh, the first notion, Lie algebra, is essentially a set of operators, that's P's here, that if you do the all possible commutators between them, what these commutators produce, is in others like essentially the same set just uh, of some maybe with some linear coefficients so by doing the commutators you don't get out of the set of the operators right and any linear combinations is still within this uh, algebraic set that's what we call the algebra so there is a closure you cannot by doing commutators get out uh, of this uh, linear space okay now the group uh, is a different object where essentially you have a, a product closure and you get to the product by exponentiating this uh, p operator say uh, in the form that we already have seen uh, that form is just uh, to generate essentially unitary operation uh, in this case uh, and then uh, the condition again is that if you make all sorts of products you still uh, be in this group uh, and that's that's what defines the group also it has a continuous parameters like taus uh, that make potentially the group also as a algebra, also as a manifold. Now, what is the advantage of uh, looking at this uh, from the point of view of Lie groups and Lie algebras is that it allows you to uh, answer some questions uh, on the like uh, functions of the non-commuting objects operators. Say, if, for example, if P1 and P2 in the, if you exponentiate linear combination of them and uh, those guys don't commute, then you can cannot write uh, those uh, th that exponent as a product of two exponents. But if P1 and P2 construct P3 and P3 doesn't really give anything else by commuting with P1 and P2, but just P1 and two, P2 back, right? So then you have a case where you have a closed algebra and uh, what this allows you to do is to write some of these uh, exponents of the sum as products of exponents and those products, they will have at well, not more than three terms, uh, each corresponds to the exponent of the well, basis of algebra, right? And also the nice thing about this product is that you can simply permute them, the order will not matter. Uh, you will always be able to present any exponent as a product of these three exponents in, in different orders. What will be different for different products is that the coefficient C3, C4, C5 can be different from the coefficient C6, C7, C8 because the order is now different, but you still can be presenting this uh, exponent of the sums or uh, different products. Now the bottom line here is that if you want to avoid the order problem, if you don't want to think about in what order should you put these exponents of P's, then take all P's that form Lie algebra. And you can easily check uh, whether the P's that you're working with uh, form Lie algebra or not. All you need is just to do the commutators and see whether new terms will appear or all terms that appear already present in your set. Okay, so that's very simple. Now, where's the caveat? The caveat here is that if you do these commutations very frequently, uh, it results in the algebraic explosion. 
what I mean by that is that just the number of operators grow uh, very quickly. And uh, what helps to kind of reduce this growth is uh, using the Hamiltonian symmetries, essentially operators that commute with Hamiltonian, number operators, spin projection as square, point group time reversal symmetries, all these symmetries, what you do with them is you essentially take the linear combination of P's that commute with symmetries. And of course, not all possible, or not, not uh, all possible combinations will do that. There will be selected ones. And uh, that's what we uh, will call symmetry adapted uh, combinations. And uh, the nice thing about these symmetry adapted combinations is that they still form uh, smaller algebras in general. That can be just seen from the uh, so-called Jacobi identity that whatever, if, if you have a symmetry operator SK and uh, it commutes with uh, any of the, of the two, say PI and PJ, so these guys are zero, then whatever the PI, PJ commutator produce also will commute with SK because it's necessarily zero. So that's, uh, that's a very nice uh, uh, property that allows you to reduce the size of the algebra if you uh, try to close it. Uh, then the symmetries help. Now, moving on, uh, so we have this unitary coupled cluster method that uh, people are quite familiar in the in this uh, VQE applications. Uh, and uh, it all started with the normal coupled cluster method, which is not unitary, but for quantum computer, we need the unitary method. And for that, what we do, we exponentiate this uh, excitation operators, Tn, it's essentially minus the excitation operator, Tn dagger. And in order to see uh, how it works, uh, so the two typical examples are singles and doubles. They are exciting essentially from the occupied orbitals to unoccupied, either one at a time or two at a time. So that two would be doubles. And then you can go higher in this hierarchy. Well, what, what is nice about this hierarchy is that all excitations essentially, they commute uh, separately or in, collection. But if you add the excitations, then the, the commutation uh, stops, uh, essentially it breaks down. Now, because in the unitary case, we need the excitations, uh, what usually people do, they do throttle approximation, right? So the, here I introduced this uh, anti-hermitian operators kappas, which are uh, essentially subtraction of excitation from the excitations, right? And what for the single double say case you can do is you present the exponent of the sum as a product of exponents in the throttle approximation. Okay, and you repeat that several times in order to uh, kind of make it more accurate. The problem with this throttle approximation is that, well, it's somewhat order dependent because this uh, double excitations and de-excitations, they don't form Lie algebra, so they are not closed. And uh, essentially, which order you put them uh, will matter for the finite large k. The larger the k, so that, that order will matter less and less. So there is an interesting alternative to this normal unitary coupled cluster, which is uh, so-called disentangled unitary coupled cluster. And it starts with the idea that unitarization or essentially adding the de excitation can be done in a product form. So if you start with the product form of the normal coupled cluster theory, because again, excitations all commute, so you can write exponent of the sum as a product of exponents, right? And then you just uh, substitute exp uh, every excitation with the sum of the excitation and de excitation, right? And so that, that is an exact transformation. Here, we don't need any trotter approximation. The problem though is that because we have operators that uh, don't commute, uh, the other problem becomes even more severe in this, in this type of approximations. How big is the difference between different orders? There is a paper uh, recently came out from the Virginia Tech uh, groups, uh, Economo Barnes and Mayhow. So what they did, they studied some of the uh, typical molecules and they saw that uh, different orders at the single double level can generate errors, uh, well, definitely higher than the chemical accuracy, which is 1 kcal per mole. So for the three out of four, there is more than uh, 1 kcal per mole errors. Uh, differences depending on the order. So differences could be quite significant. But beyond numerics, it can be even worse because uh, there is this problem that uh, recently also was published by Evangelista Chan and Scuseria. It's a very model problem. It's uh, in a sense, not even a hydrogen uh, molecule, but 
they consider two electrons on two orbitals. So you can place two electrons on two orbitals in this uh, four uh, kind of uh, ways. And the exact wave function would be just a linear combination of uh, Slater determinants corresponding to this uh, kind of placements, right? So the bar on top of the index means essentially the uh, beta spin and the no bar means alpha spin, okay? And then what you can do for this model problem, you can construct, try to construct a wave function in this disentangled unitary coupled cluster way, which is a product of one double excitation and the excitation and two singles. Details are not that important here. What is important is that there are at least two ways, singles first and double or double in between two singles. Turns out if you uh, are interested in reproducing a certain wave function, this is the wave function they try to reproduce, which is a very simple kind of bell kind of pair analog. Uh, and uh, they try to get this uh, function uh, by optimizing the amplitudes T3, T2, T1. Turned out that uh, for one order they could do it and for another order they could just simply cannot. So that order, no matter how you optimize the amplitudes, will not be able to uh, get you the function, all right? So the overlap will not be uh, one. And uh, that was surprising result, uh, okay? So because essentially we have all the excitations and the excitations, but they don't form the algebra. And that's why uh, essentially that, that was kind of the reason for, for this problem. Uh, we decided to investigate this further, make the algebra out of three operators. And uh, it turns out that it generates eight possible operators these operators are pretty much the excitation, the excitation, but on top of that, we have uh, some occupation number operators. So details again, are not that important, but there are eight of this. And if you do some Lie algebra analysis, you can break down these eight operators into uh, like, you can add some structure. These theories are kind of well developed for Lie algebras. So there, there is a possibility to uh, kind of uh, zoom into the center. Center is the center, uh, is kind of two operators that commute with everything. So they are trivial, they just stay in the phase. And then there are two algebras which are uh, isomorphic to SO3, which are rotations in the three-dimensional uh, three-dimensional object rotations, essentially, right? So you can uh, get these algebras. Now, still, you have at least six operators because uh, two algebras give you uh, six operators. It's like algebra of angular momentums, essentially, SO3. And if you want to reduce the number of uh, operators, you can add symmetries. So adding this number as Z and S square gives you these four operators. And uh, again, doing the structure, you can bring it down to just one SO3 algebra and the center which commutes with everything and uh, doesn't really matter. Now with this three, that form algebra, we can reproduce the function, this one or any other by doing the product of exponent in any order we want, right? So that's, that's really nice. And just to summarize the fermionic basis algebra, uh, if you work in fermionic representation, the only algebras that are closing uh, in polynomial number of uh, kind of terms is the single excitations or uh, kind of mean field algebras. If you include the uh, double excitations, then in order to close algebras, you need to essentially include all possible excitation and that grows exponentially, which is not nice. Now, fermionic excitations conserve by construction already number and spin projection, but in order to conserve a square, you need to combine some of this uh, excitation, the excitations, but that's possible. And another nice feature of fermionic algebras is that Pauli products that appear if you do the jordan Wigner transformation, say, on the single excitation, uh, they, they give you commuting operators, which makes it somewhat easier to uh, implement the circuit later. Now, just really quickly, there is another hierarchy, qubit coupled cluster method, uh, which is more general because what it does, it just looks at, uh, it essentially works in the qubit space. And uh, what it does, it just uh, finds the, the piece that uh, minimize the energy uh, the most, right? So of course there is exponential number of P's, but we found a way how to do this uh, screening of P's in polynomial uh, time. So this is the paper. Now what's nice about QCC is that the number of two qubit gates typically is much smaller than in the unitary coupled cluster hierarchy because we're just going directly for the energy. 
And uh, what is uh, what, what, what we studied in this work uh, is what kind of algebras can you produce if you analyze the uh, this uh, Pauli products? Turns out there are commuting sets, sets of P's which commute, and anti-commuting sets. And the commuting sets a lot like essentially abelian algebras. They are a lot like uh, fermionic excitations, or fermionic excitations give them really, and there is not much new there. But in anti-commuting sets. Uh, they can be closed into the algebras, which are a little bit bigger, but still polynomial in size, S O M algebras. All you need is just to add to all anti-commuting terms uh, their products, and you close the algebra. And they are more related to my expectations. To accommodate uh, symmetries, though, it becomes really hard. Now, uh, here, just an uh, illustration that uh, uh, essentially these anti-commuting things can be uh, well, really uh, removing the order problem and uh, the example of water molecule. I'll skip it just by uh, for the sake of time and uh, just say that, uh, of course, if you close the algebra, then order doesn't matter. And uh, just to summarize, I think that still in variational quantum eigens over two big problems, uh, constructing unitary ansatz and uh, measurement scheme. Now, in order to remove the order dependence in the, in the unitary construction, Lie algebra seems like a, a good way to go. Uh, the only problem is that algebra size uh, usually grow and the symmetries is one way to remove that uh, growth or sub subside that growth. Now, there are two types, fermionic and uh, uh, qubit algebras. So we describe them quite in details in our work. You can uh, kind of look more in details that. And with that, uh, I would like to acknowledge my co-authors, Manuel and Robert, who worked in my group, and useful discussions with people all over the world, uh, probably though, maybe in, uh, mostly in North America, funding from uh, Zapata, OTI, and NSERC, and uh, all of you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Thank very, you much. very much. Okay, Alba. It was a nice presentation. So let me check the chat because I think there are some questions there. So, yeah, Pablo Moreno asked, uh, is there anywhere where one can find the complexity or runtime of the gradient descent UCC or any other method to choose uh, the Pauli operators that you are introducing? Right. So the, uh... We were not really interested in the studying the how quickly you optimize the amplitudes in front. As I understood the question, the question was about the gradient descent and uh, how to optimize the amplitudes, uh, right? Uh, so we were not looking into that. Uh, I'm sorry, he, he just said that he meant the T's at the parameterized the UCC, not the, the Pauli operators. So, sorry. So that did another right. message. Right, right, right. So, Generally, we assume that once you have uh, a UCC and you have uh, the, all the UCC operators, essentially, they form commuting Paulis. And so then you can break the exponent of UCC operator into just simply product of Paulis. Uh, so that, that is not a problem uh, because they are commuting. Okay. I see Matthias has a question. Yeah. Hey Arthur, uh, nice to see you again and uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, I had a question about uh, the algebras being closed only for single particle and uh, the full uh, manifold of like the exact solution, right? Is, are you sure there's nothing in between? Can you not cover it with any exponential of a function more than... Uh, okay, so there is nothing in between if you're working with the fermionic excitations and de excitations. Uh, that's, uh, I think, relatively uh, oh, historically known fact, right? So I think Kudzelnik was the first who wrote about that. Uh, but what we found with qubit algebras, uh, which are more related to Majorana excitations, they break, say, number of, uh, number of electron kind of uh, symmetry. And there you can have something in between the just the single excitations and full CI answer for the for this number of orbitals. Uh, there are some closed algebras, but they break symmetries. And then yeah, so maybe a follow up, and then when you project, you lose this sort of closeness or. Uh... Uh, well, not really, because projection. If you think about the projection like a posteriori thing, like uh, mm -hmm. once you create your circuit. Right, and then you create, you introduce a projection. 
uh, that doesn't really change, introduction of the projection doesn't really change the fact that your circuit uh, is uh, invariant with respect to kind of putting the, the gates in a different order and getting so, the yeah, same so result. That's a, so that's a promising thing to do, ju just work in different uh, quasi-particles or different right. bases or, yeah. Okay, right, thank right. you. Yeah, Philip Jensen has also a question. Could you repeat why the order does not matter in the algebra if the algebra is closed? Right. So the algebra. Okay. So because simply all group elements they can be uh, generated by doing the exponent of the basis uh, kind of elements of algebra, right? And so if you have elements that, like, say, SU two group. Uh, and SU2 algebra has X, Y, and Z, so just one qubit, right? So then exponent of uh, any operator that is linear combination of X plus Y plus Z essentially can be repre uh, represented as a product of exponent of X with some constant exponent of Y, exponent of Z. So just you cannot get outside of the group by exponentiation and the group can always be presented as the exponents of the algebra elements. That's why, I guess. We have a question from Angelina Gokhal. Mm -hmm. Would you like to ask yourself or or maybe you can unmute her ask or I will read it from the uh, chat. You can unmute her, yeah, it just will be probably easier. Uh, I don't know if I can yeah. I think that Orlando. Hello, Dr. Oh. Atu. Yeah. Uh, yeah, am I audible? Yeah. So you mentioned about the second quantized form which can store more states. Uh, probably my question is too broad at the moment. But in the area of quantum image processing, uh, will this new form help in storing or representing a three-channel color image in lesser number of qubits? If I'm trying yeah. to get the application. <laughs> I'll need to think about your question because I'm not very familiar yeah. with the image processing, uh, quantum image processing. And uh, all right, so let, let me get back to you on that later, maybe offline. Uh, yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question.